Robinson he even went down the sideline and he's got Cass Decker bringing you UCLA football content all throughout the year for LA Football Network. What is up, Bruin Bible listeners? We have another advertisement for you. We are so lucky to be sponsored by the great people at Athletic Greens. Uh, I started taking Athletic Greens specifically because I was lacking energy, lacking focus throughout the day, and needed some special pick-me-up ingredients to make things happen in my life. Athletic Greens has done just that. I've become absolutely addicted to the process. It has over 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, probiotics, adaptogens to make your life easier uh, by doing this during the day. I like to take it to start my mornings off. I like to do it before a workout. makes you feel energized, focused, and just have a lot more energy throughout the day than I typically expected. But right now, is the, it's the time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every single day. Uh, that's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. Uh, to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to be give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash LAFB. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash LAFB to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Athletic Greens, a game changer when it comes to your health and your focus and your mindset. Now to the Bruin Bible. What's up, Bruin Bible listeners? This is your host, Will Decker. Wanted to bring you the sponsors for today's episode, Bet Online, where the gambling starts. I've got a bunch of good bets going on right now. I've got the Lakers making the playoffs. We've got futures bets coming around for MLB baseball. March Madness is around the corner. NBA playoffs on the horizon, too. Make sure to check out all of the gambling and all of your gambling needs at Bet Online where the gambling starts. Make sure to use promo code LAFB to get a little discount. Uh, everything is great on Bet Online. I use it weekly for all my gambling needs. Make sure to check it out. LAFB gambling, and now to the Bruin Bible. SEC offers, and that's pretty much the list of recruits for UCLA. This is Will Decker, your host, with Jamal Madney, who signed out. Uh, What an episode that was. Uh, Make sure you are liking and subscribing the YouTube channel we've got with UCLA LAFB. It's going to be a fun year. We've got a special episode coming on Saturday uh, with one of the UCLA fans that we would love to talk to. I'll let you Get to that when the episode comes out, but make sure you're tuning into all Bruin Bible stuff. Will Decker, your host, we are officially out. What is up and welcome to a Saturday afternoon, rainy day in LA, snowing in some parts of Southern California. It's a little nuts out here, but the madman was kind enough to join me on this Saturday afternoon as we got to talk some big news. We have wanted to kind of manifest a new defensive coordinator. Anyone who knows me, as Madman likes to call me, the leader of the secondary to none campaign, it's come to fruition. Bruin fans, it's time to celebrate. First and foremost, we want to wish the health, you know, the health of Bill McGovern to be in the right places. Bill McGovern is an outstanding guy, and he was really well-liked during his time at UCLA. So first and foremost, we do want to say that about Bill McGovern. But – Once we can get that past that fact, I think it's a very, very exciting time to be a UCLA fan. De'Anton Lynn, the new defensive coordinator for UCLA Bruins, a spry 33-year-old, you know, assistant that's gone through the ranks of the NFL. He was the son of former Chargers coaches, LA people would know, Anthony Lynn. Madman, give me your first taste on what De'Anton Lynn brings to UCLA and how excited Bruins fans should be that he's now their D coordinator. Yeah, well, I mean, much like I think most of Bruin Nation, when the story first came out, uh, I had to rely on Google to find out, you know, who is DeAnton Lynn? You know, who is the man behind the name and the hire? Um, And so obviously we had a great conversation 
last week, Will, around defensive coordinator prospects. We are talking about Jim Leonard, Gary Patterson, some guys under the radar, a little bit of Jeremy Pruitt. So we certainly manifested this reality, albeit with some different dudes uh, in the conversation. But the more I had an opportunity to digest, understand where De'Anton Lynn came from, what his background is, and how he complements where this program wants to go, the more I was in love, truthfully. And I think this is a paradigm-altering hire for Chip Kelly moving forward because I think De'Anton Lynn will brings five kind of key ingredients. And I, and I sort of mentioned this on social media. One is just a youth and a relatability to the modern player. You talked about him being a spry 33 years old and having formerly played in the NFL. There's just a relatability to what it takes to make it to that next level. The second to me is there's a hunger and a passion you can see from the, you know, this young man in terms of where he's gone, the stops he's made and, and breaking out of the shadow of his father and just the personality. A lot of videos I've seen of him just interacting with his players and that hunger and that passion, when you combine it with the likes of a Ken Norton Jr., a Deshaun Foster, a Jerry Neuheisel, you have now this nucleus of young, energetic coaches that are really passionate about where they are and what they want to do, which is really magical. Third for me, Will, is to our earlier point, he was flying under the radar. And, and as a result of that, that's where you get the high value. And I think that in terms of how much we spent for DeAnton Lynn hasn't been disclosed, but I think the value we're going to get from a young man who was primarily a position coach, secondary, defensive backs, defensive assistant, to then make that jump all the way to defensive coordinator. I know earlier in my career, when I got big promotions, there's just so much excitement, so much enthusiasm, energy. You want to validate the people that believed in you. You want to prove the naysayers wrong. You want to do things differently, and you want to be very innovative along the way. And then, Will, I think he has that coaching pedigree with his father. And coming from a family with a coaching lineage, I think, gives you just such a tremendous advantage, not only in how to conduct yourself from a game plan, a strategic perspective, how to handle yourself in the locker room, but also how to build a life outside of the field, the little nuances and intricacies that only you know when your father has been a coach and growing up in that family that you can't really teach, that you can't really learn in other experiences. And then finally, Will, that NFL background and that NFL experience, the Ravens, the Chargers, the Jets, the Texans. And, you know, he can walk into a living room. He can walk into a practice and say, this is what it takes to make it to the NFL. This is what it takes to be Lamar Jackson. This is what it takes to be a great NFL player. And if you do more of X or do more of Y, you can get there because I've seen it and I've been very successful. So when you look at that whole package, Will, and the fact that he's 33, really kudos to Chip Kelly to kind of go away from his inner circle. That's been kind of the knock with Ozanero and McGovern going away from his inner circle, older guys, guys that he knows, older white men. And now you're going for a young African-American coach where it maybe is not part of your inner circle, but you know that in terms of where this program is going, De'Anton Lynn also played at Penn State. That awareness of the Big Ten territory as you segue into 24 and just Chip acknowledging, hey, I'm a great X's and O's guy. I'm a cerebral guy. I need to sort of outsource the passion and the energy and the enthusiasm with the media and with the players to the likes of my defensive coordinator and Ken and Jerry and Deshaun. I think really speaks volumes about him as a leader. I love this pick, and I think that we're going to reap some tremendous benefits. And as you said, Will, to wrap it up before giving it back to you, really all we need is a top 50, top 60 defense here. When you couple that with the offensive ingenuity that Chip brings to the table, this is a perennial conference title contender with the opportunity for more. So we're just asking the Anton Lynn to go from the hundreds to get into the 50s and the 60s, and I think he's well-positioned to do that. You made some great points along that, and I think, for me, it just checks a lot of boxes to where the coaching world is going as a whole. I think you you have trends that you know can last and trends that falter in any 
different field or, you know, position when it comes to jobs, society, the market. But there's been a clear trend, whether it's the professional ranks, the younger ranks, that these younger coaches have had great impacts. When you look at the likes of a Sean McVay, even Lincoln Riley to some extent, just a younger guy that can relate more to these locker rooms. And I think just bringing in a DeAnton Lynn, a 33-year-old, with the, you know, ability he has, you know, what he's been able to do. He was coaching the Ravens, you know, secondary group. That is an elite group, to say the least. You can't – I don't care how much nepotism you have to get into these NFL circles. That's a legitimate job that requires you to interview well, especially when you look at what John Harbaugh and some of the coaches he's produced from the Baltimore Ravens ranks. I mean, I had to look back – into his coaching tree and guys he's actually been able to develop. Look at this, Madman. First year he's there, it's 2008. Rex Ryan was his defensive coordinator. Rex Ryan becomes an NFL head coach. Chuck Pagano became the Colts head coach. Cam Cameron even coached for the Miami Dolphins for a year. Mike Pettin, very bad head coach, but a very good position coach when you break it down. And then Vic Fangio. I mean, these guys are household names. I mean, what I love about the Harbaugh coaching tree is they are guys that are so competitive, so you have to know your your P's and Q's to be a part of them. It's not like, a, you know, McVeigh at times, I feel like, you know, hire some of his friends or people that are around him. You have to be, you know, credited in the right areas to be worthy of a, a John Harbaugh or a Jim Harbaugh, you know, hire for a position group. And that is what a DeAnton Lynn has brought to the table here with his secondary coaching and it just makes me excited because I mentioned to you th uh, this over text. I mentioned it over social media. But Michigan, the University of Michigan, our future Big Ten foes, did something very similar to what we just did about two years ago with Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh hired Mike McDonald, a uh, defensive assistant for the Ravens. He went up to University of Michigan, was there about a year, maybe two max, and he absolutely killed it. He is one of the guys mainly credited for developing the likes of an Aiden Hutchinson, a Dax Hill, players that made that Michigan defense able to get to the college football playoff and succeed. So when you have that coaching pedigree and you bring that in there, I, I'm thinking very big things for DeAnton Lynn, knowing the background of these Ravens assistants and what could potentially happen. So I'm really pumped about this. And I want to poise you with this question because, you know, we made a big thing about Chip coming back to UCLA. We totally believe he's the right hire. I don't think you'd find two to three better offensive coaches in the entire country with a guy like Chip Kelly. But this is an interesting point. Do you think one of these stipulations, or maybe two of them, if you ask, uh, you know, the fan base, was, you know, Martin Jarman goes in to Chip, our friend of the show. And he goes, hey, we want to have you back. Your success is something that we value here at UCLA. We've seen a track record improve. However, we need to see you more improved on the recruiting front, which he has done. We've seen him get the likes of Adante more. We've seen him, you know, show more face at high schools and things like that on social media. You saw him around. And two, you need to revamp this defense, dude. Like, we have figured that out. You know, the offense isn't the problem. It will never be the problem with you. The defense needs to shape up. And lo and behold, he's made some key hires this year. Do you think that was something that was discussed between Martin Jarman and Chip Kelly when re-signing Chip to UCLA Madman? I think so, Will. I think it was – and it's a great point that you bring up and – you can see Martin Jarman's fingerprints on some of these recent hires, younger, more diverse, more energy, big 10 ties. Those are a lot of characteristics that you can describe Martin Jarman himself. And so you know that a, not only do I think Martin Jarman made that stipulation a chip and say, Hey, how can I help you be more successful? Cause I can see it. I can see the path. I can see what you're bringing to the table. But at the same time, we're not Oregon of 10 years ago where we can just let the facilities and the Nike, Nike relationship sell itself. We need to be a little bit more proactive in terms of getting athletes, getting more competitive on the defensive side of the ball, and also doing more on the branding side of things. And so I think that was definitely a conversation to say, hey, do the things that you're doing really well, but I need you to be more open to these other areas to really make this a long-term relationship and make it work successfully. And I think that not only did Martin Jarman make that stipulation, but I think Martin Jarman has offered partnership with Chip. I don't necessarily think it's, hey, Chip, go do all of these things. 
but it's one of those things where we know this needs to be done. How can we work together to make this happen? And I think that Martin's doing an incredible job behind the scenes, making those phone calls, you know, understanding who else is out there in other networks and kind of bringing all that together and bringing that to Chip. And then you got to love Chip being in his late 50s, still being receptive to that change. We see that, Will, with other older coaches, maybe having a little bit of a hard time with that. The likes of a Bill Belichick, the likes of a Nick Saban sometimes now, of sticking with guys that they know. So I think that partnership has worked really well. And Will, I think you and I have said this now for a couple of years. When you look at athletic director, football coach, and even extended to basketball coach, I don't think that there are three better hires across those three key positions in all of intercollegiate athletics at any other place but UCLA. I think they have hit an absolute home run in those three areas. And it's great to see this partnership between Chip and Martin grow. And it's only going to make things more successful going into the Big Ten and beyond. I couldn't agree more, man. And I just, it makes you so excited to see this. And, you know, having a guy like DeAnton Lynn come in, that young energy, going to hit the recruiting trail. And just, you know, we've talked about it at length, man. The secondary is a problem. We need to fix it. And for so many years, it was not addressed. But you look at this hire and the Cody Whitefield hire, you know, coming down as a secondary coach, they're finally taking the next necessary steps to fix the biggest issue, the Achilles heel, if you will, with UCLA football. And that's got to be an exciting thing, whether, you know, you want DeAnton Lynn to prove himself is another thing. I think we all want to see that as a fan base. But the fact that we're taking the steps to try to get to that place, that we're really making the effort. I think the, the frustrating thing with McGovern was, is McGovern was basically as an arrow's mentor. So we yeah. were just kind of like, it's going to be the same thing. It's a different guy, same system, same, you know, play calling issues are still going to be in place there. With this, this is a whole new scheme. Younger look at it. It's just the sky's the limit, I feel like, for this team because we've talked about how talented this secondary is and just the coaching they're going to get from a guy like DeAnton Lynn, who, you know, was a very solid player at Penn State, went to the NFL as a player, coached the Marcus Peters, the Marlon Humphreys, the Kyle Hamiltons in the secondary. You know, Devin Kirkwood was our breakout guy last year, and I felt like he just didn't benefit from great coaching. And, you know, Jalen Davies is a guy, Kamari Ramsey. You know, we got these guys, RJ Jones, this new four-star recruit. So you have talented dudes in there. Now it's about putting pen to paper and seeing what these guys can do. That makes me really, really excited as someone that covers UCLA football. And to celebrate this defensive coordinator hiring, Madman, I kind of, you know, brainstormed a fun thing we could do for the Bruin faithful. And we want to rank our top five position coaches within UCLA. And upon looking at it, there are some guys that I think are top five to 10 in the country at what they yep. do for UCLA. And, you know, some guys that are running under the radar, I think coming into next season that could be taking the next step for, you know, open positions if they continue to excel elsewhere, you know, so it's, it's really exciting time for UCLA football. And we got to do the top five, you know, position coaches for UCLA. And as always, I got to give it to my guy on the right, Madman. You get the first selection in the position coach draft. Who are you going with and why with the number one overall? I love coach? it, Will. First of all, I mean, I love I love the concept. It's always so fun and innovative to, to be having this back and forth with you. A lot of interesting choices, right, when you look at this staff and it, it's so energizing. But I got to go with, with Tim Drabino and to kick wow. things off. Uh, you know, I think that when you look at – what is really the bread and butter of UCLA football now and into the future? It is that running game, and it is the ability for the offensive line to be able to create schemes around kind of that spread zone running game. And when you look at what Dravino has been able to do the last couple of years and couple that with the pedigree, again, where he comes from, there, there's that key word again, being the offensive line coach from Stanford from 07 to 10 at that peak moment where Stanford became that physical football team of the West Coast predicated on the offensive line, going to the likes of a Michigan with Jim Harbaugh. We all know what Michigan brings to the table in terms of power running game with great offensive line. And now bringing that thinking to UCLA, 
No unit made a greater jump last year, like we talked about, Will, than the offensive line. And I think that is such an art and a craft to be a great offensive line coach. Because truth be told, being in Southern California, being in this hotbed of recruiting talent, you're going to get your skill guys, right? You're, there's enough four stars to go around where even if SC gets their guys and Oregon gets their guys, there are enough guys to be at the running back position, at the wide receiver position to be dangerous. But how do you take that next step and really be able to be an elite offense, especially when you know how Chip thinks from a run first perspective, you need great offensive line play. So for that reason, Timmy D is my guy, not to be confused with Tim Duncan, but you know, the other (laughs) Timmy D for UCLA, Gravino is my guy. It may surprise some, but that's my number one pick. Tim Drevno, man, great first pick. And you just look at what he's been able to accomplish. I think those Stanford teams, you know, when Harbaugh got there and they were really able to turn the tide, they were known for running the football down your throat, big physical run games, bigger backs. And then because I know this and I, I know LA FB fans are sick of hearing this from me. I'm a 49ers fan, but Drevno was a coach there. And I do know this for a fact, Joe Staley, and Mike Yapati, two of the better linemen of that time period, they credit a lot of their development to what Staley or to what Drevno did with the both of those guys. So this guy was a master at the O line. He then went to Michigan. He went to USC. These are about you know probably two of the top ten jobs you know if you were, were to be on a coaching staff with those universities. So I thought you were going elsewhere with the first pick, but that is a phenomenal pick. And just I, I can't say it enough. We talked about it, you know, with our you know, we did the the battle, the USC UCLA rivalry show, and you guys came to me and asked me to go. Who? What is the area that has shocked you the most about UCLA football? And I was like, the O line. It's not even close because of what he was able to generate last year. And you know, you mentioned Drevno and just the ability to coach players up. Moffy never played the offensive line until last season, and you look at what his tape showed last year and what he could potentially do. I think he's going to be a top three round pick for a guy that never played the offensive yeah. line until this year. Exactly. Think about that coaching and that level of what it takes to put in the effort and work. So Tim Drevno is a phenomenal first pick. Not where I expected, but I'm very, very happy on that first pick. So Tim Drevno off the board. There's two big names. I thought one of these was going to go first. Drevno is going to be, I thought, the third pick in this draft. No disrespect to him. I can go... I can go running backs or I can go linebackers. That's kind of where I'm looking at right now. Yep. And I think for pedigree, I think for what he has done in the track record, I've got to go with Ken Norton Jr. on this. Yep. Ken Norton Jr. And I want to say this because I think people don't understand how big of a hire this was for UCLA football. There would be NFL teams right now looking for linebackers coaches that would be begging Ken Norton Jr. to come and help out their linebacker room. I think – Probably 20 of the 32 teams in the NFL are like, listen, whatever you want, we'll pay for it. We'll fly you out. We'll do whatever. And it's just, it shows his track record and what Pete Carroll believed in him, you know, for him being a defensive coordinator. We'll break it down from the beginning what he's been able to do. USC. And yes, I know it was developing talent there when it came to the Cushing, Maluga, Matthews linebacking room. But people forget Clay Matthews was a walk-on at USC. This man developed Clay Matthews into one of the best Outside pass rushing linebackers. You know about Cushing. Cushing was a mainstay in the NFL for years. Maluga was our guy, often confused with Domate Pecco, but was a great outside linebacker as well. Um, So you saw that. That was probably the most iconic linebacking room in the last 20 to 30 years, I would say, in the Pac-12, at the very least, in West Coast football. He goes to the NFL in the Seahawks. Bobby Wagner, you could make the argument, is the best linebacker in the NFL over the last 10 years. Like you can make that argument. You can see the statistics. We even argued if it was a good hire or, you know, free agent pickup or not last year, he outperformed, you know, his contract. I would say they're cutting him because they're kind of looking to be in rebuild mode with these rumors about Jalen Ramsey being on the block too. But Bobby Wagner, once again, turned in another year where he was worthy of all pro status. I think he's made seven or eight all pro teams in the last 10 years. So Bobby Wagner, this guy gets credit from Ken Norton Jr. Developing him. Don't let, don't let me even bring up Ken or, uh, you know, KJ Wright coming in the situation, a former Pro Bowl linebacker in his own right. And then he goes to Oakland, and he, he develops Cleo Mack into a defensive player of the year. He helps him reach his ceiling. 
And even the limited amount of, you know, games we were able to see as a UCLA fan last year, the, the, the toughness, the physicalness of that linebacker room took a gigantic step forward with the likes of him coaching up a Muwasau. John John Vaughn might be a player that I think could make all Pac-12 status if he just is willing to get on the football field. This man is balling on the baseball diamond, by the way. Three home runs in like a three-game span over the past week. But John John Vaughn took a huge jump this year, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Ken Norton Jr. was in the linebacker room. What do you think about Ken Norton Jr. being the second selection in the position coach draft, Matt? No, I mean, I Will, it's a no-brainer. And, you know, you've, you've laid it out, his history so well. Look, he's this, he's this incredible combination of things. And you touched on one of the dimensions, which is player development, right? And we don't have to, you know, double-click on that. You did an outstanding job there between SC and the Seahawks and the Raiders. But then it's also as a player, right, having that first-hand, first-order relatability, still to this day the only man to win three consecutive Super Bowls with the Cowboys and the Niners in the mid-'90s. And then he's also an alum where the passion for the university just oozes out and bleeds over from a recruiting perspective. And then fourth is his innovative approach to different types of linebackers. When you look at Moasau being more of a traditional linebacker of the ilk of a Bobby Wagner, you know, kind of the, this rangy, linebacker to kind of get to different spots on the field. Then you look at what he's doing with Latu, who's sort of in this hybrid pass rush on the defensive line type of mode and kind of crossing over there. How do you handle somebody like that who's not necessarily going to put his knuckles into the ground every play and then also play linebacker? And then you look at what he's doing with a John John Vons, who's more of a hybrid linebacker safety type of individual much in the way that the Chargers are using Derwin James from time to time. So he has this innovative ability to be able to design a strategy around his personnel. It's not like he's force-fitting a certain type of play around the talent that he has. He goes and sees what the talent that he has and then adjusts accordingly. And that's what makes him really special. And that's what makes great coaches truly great. So when you, when you see that relatability to strategy, he's an alum, he was a great player, he has this track record as a coach, he understands what it takes to get to the NFL, he's just got all of the ingredients. And then when you sort of overlay that with him essentially being the ambassador for the program, kind of the, 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 the recruiter, if you will, for the program, in much the way uh, Dante Williams was for USC, now just the value goes through the roof. And again, I think that you could easily make the argument that Ken Norton Jr. is number one on this list, like you and I talked about very, very easily um, because he's just that vital and important to this program moving forward. And I think resume, it's close between him and Drevno. I think yeah. it's oh, – yeah. you know, oh, both yeah. of them have very extensive you know, resumes within the professional and college ranks. So either way you go there, you know, it's a, it's a home run. So – the first two picks in the bag, sending it back to my guy, Madman. Third pick in the inaugural position coaches draft for the Bruin Bible. Who you got, Bob? Well, well, Thriller, I don't think I'm going to be making a lot of headlines with this one, you know, the way maybe with the first pick. But I think this is sort of who we think of as the other great member of this coaching staff from a positional perspective, and it is Deshaun Foster. And, and everything that he has done – in terms of running back development, when you start looking at the lineage of running backs at UCLA the last several years, obviously we're coming off Charbonnet and then Charbonnet and Britton Brown and then Demetric Felton and Joshua Kelly. And you just have that thread of great, not just college players, but guys that are playing on Sundays, guys with the opportunity to make it to the NFL and thrive in the NFL. Deshaun Foster just has, again, that it factor and that sense of recruiting the right guy, being able to develop him the right way, and then getting him in positions of success. And we're so excited about TJ Harden next year because that's the next prodigy for Deshaun Foster. And he's also the guy that runs most like Deshaun Foster did at UCLA. And again, Will, there are these common elements, right? 
He knows how to develop different types of running backs, power, speed, ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. So different types of running backs have succeeded at UCLA. It's not one archetype of running back, much in the way Ken Norton did has done with the linebacker room. He's a great Bruin. Again, alum, bleeds for the program. That energy is just so contagious moving forward. He played in the league, played in some of the biggest games. He was in an NFC championship game. He was in a Super Bowl he, you know, with the Panthers. I mean, played on the highest of stages, can relate to that player of today and say, this is what it takes because I was there and I can take you there. And then beyond that, again, it's that youthful energy that he can bring on that recruiting trail as well. So Deshaun, Ken Norton, Drevno, all three of these guys, it's really 1A, 1B, 1C. You could have mixed and matched this any other way. But these three guys, in many ways, are sort of the nucleus, the heart and soul of this staff outside of Chip and outside of DeAnton Lynn. And we're just so thrilled for him. And I'm so happy to see Deshaun getting the recognition will on a national basis. You know, he's up for awards every year. Every time you see sort of positional coaches at the running back level, he's always in that top 10, top eight, top 15. So folks are recognizing his play. I think that he's still wildly underrated. And I think that you can make the argument that he's one of the best five or seven running backs coaches in the country without a doubt in my mind. And I'm just so happy that he's a Bruin. And I think that tie to UCLA is what's going to keep him at UCLA for the foreseeable future. Underrated is the right word, too, because you look at the backs that he's been able to put into the NFL, and, you know, you'd argue that, hey, you know, Alabama or Ohio State or Clemson, these guys have had more success. Look at what they're working with recruit-wise when it comes into the door. And I'll take you to walk through some of the guys that have been recruited to UCLA. So Joshua Kelly was a two-star recruit that transferred in from UC Davis. NFL bound, top five round pick. Demetric Felton was a low three star wide receiver that converted to the running back position. NFL bound, draft pick. Britton Brown, low three star, went to Duke, you know, which I think a lot of people refer to as kind of the black sheep of ACC football for the matter. And we got a lot of Duke players, you know, on the roster, you know, whether it was Jake Bobo last year, Gary Smith progressing forward, even the likes of Jeff Ferris, you know, coming over. But hey, I mean, it's just the reality of the situation. Duke is not a great place to go football-wise. And, I mean, he took Britton Brown and made him an NFL back. You look at what he did with Charbonnet. I think this is a very underrated point because Charbonnet was a very highly recruited tailback. Oaks Christian could have gone anywhere he wanted. Had early success at Michigan, but really fell out of favor yep. for Michigan. A lot of running backs kind of lose their identity, you know, so to speak, when they, you know, get taken out of rotation, especially a star player like Charbonnet. Charbonnet transfers to UCLA, and it was like not only did they rebuild his image as a tailback, they got him as close as possible to reaching his ceiling, which was the best running back in the country, you know, which we believe to this day. You know, Bijan Robinson, I can hear the argument, but I'm taking my guy Charbonnet all day in that. So you have that, and then you look at what he's doing with TJ Harden, a guy that three star recruit as well, not highly recruited, coming in there and making that play. And I just think the match of what Deshaun Foster brings to the running back room with Chip Kelly's offensive play style is just a match made in heaven. And it's just so fun to watch these guys explode on the scene. And I think that's a big reason why Carson Steele wanted to come. And if you look at it just from a numbers standpoint, you know, Carson Steele was probably the hottest running back transfer on the market. Yes. You know, you look at what he was able to do and just him committing to UCLA and saying, I want to be a part of that. I've seen the track record. I'm trying to get to the NFL myself. I know what it takes for a Chip Kelly, you know, Deshaun Foster led team to do that. And it's just, it's mind blowing. So Deshaun Foster, that's actually who I thought was going to be the number one pick off the board. Yeah. I actually think he's the number one running back coach in the country. And I will plant my flag there because of the talent and it's coaching to me when it's impressive. And you've said this about quarterbacks. It's not about those tier a schools where they got all the talent. It's how they develop at those B level schools you know, with the subpar talent. And to me, that's the most impressive thing in coaching where replacing that A-level talent for a team with recruits. And, and he does that as well as anybody. So I think Deshaun Foster, number three, is a great, great pick, Madman. And this is where it kind of gets interesting, too, for pick number four, because we have the three obvious names off the board. You can go in and 
any variety of different directions. I've checked him out. You know, I was looking at a Ryan Gunderson, the quarterback coach there. He's not going to make my list. He could make yours. I was looking at a Jeff Ferris, the tight ends coach. Not going to make mine. Yep. But I think the guy that just represents UCLA in all the right ways and is a guy that I think we're really going to see the depths of his capabilities come out this year with a more pro-style quarterback in place, Jerry Neuheisel, man. I mean, the, the, you know, his old man was the UCLA coach for years. He rebuilt – the roster we had Eric Hendricks on this week he said the reason he wanted to go to UCLA was a guy like Neuheisel so Jerry Neuheisel and just to put it in perspective I think he did such an outstanding job with the development of Kyle Phillips and getting him to the level arguably the best UCLA receiver in 20 to 25 years you know you see that we saw what he was able to do with Bobo this year who I still think is underrated when it comes to the next level and then you couple that with the transfer portals he was able to do and what he does in the recruiting world and how he, you know, makes the team feel, you know, with, he's the guy, he's the first guy with the water bottle celebration every single time in the locker room. I'm pretty sure he started it. Jerry Neuheisel is my fourth pick. And I think with TMA coming in this year, I think Cam Brown, some of these transfers that could have gone to a lot of different schools coming to UCLA, I got to put Neuheisel at four and we're going to reap the benefits of that. What do you think of Neuheisel coming in at number four, Madden? No, I love it, Will. And and frankly, if you were going to go in a different direction at four, Neuheisel was going to be my pick there at five. So I think you and I are completely on the same page. I think the interesting thing about Neuheisel is he has done a lot with a few shots on goal, right? There, there It's interesting with Deshaun Foster, what makes him so special is he was able to take those two and three stars and make them great. But he also had options, right, where we're four or five deep, six deep at running back. Deshaun Foster had the eye to recognize who's really that diamond in the rough in that group of six that, that I can really see in shape and mold, which is brilliant. In the case of Neuheisel, we're often not as deep at receiver, and we certainly haven't been the last couple of years. And so for him to take Phillips and make him – arguably one of the steals of the draft on the offensive side for him to then take a larger player in Jake Bobo and have him be the de facto number one receiver. Obviously, even with Dulcich, Will, there was a lot of wide receiver type of concepts that he was running in terms of bunch formations where Chip and he were collaborating. Now you look moving forward and now you got – Sturdivant coming in from Cal, what Jerry Neuheisel is going to be able to do there, what he's going to be able to do with Kyle Ford, what he's going to be able to do with the returners in the form of TMA and Brown. He clearly understands how to get the most out of his players. And we've really seen a shift here in year over year, being able to rely on a wide receiver. Number one, that has not been the case at UCLA really even when you go back to the mid to late 2000s. I mean, the last, even when Hundley was there, we had kind of Jordan Payton. Even with Rosen, you had Lasley. But that was more of a product of volume of attempts and going to kind of their favorite targets than necessarily those guys developing. And that, that represented itself when Payton and Lasley couldn't quite make it in the NFL. Neuheisel is not only getting production out of these guys but he's also getting them nfl ready and it's just such a great point point. and then when you talk about the ultimate ambassador for ucla and when you talk about again that common thread keeps coming up pedigree in terms of the son of a coach and a former alum and player at ucla so that love is so pure honestly will there's a lot of companies fortune 20 companies they think about succession planning and they think about succession planning very early. And they think five years out, 10 years out in terms of who's going to be the next executives, who's going to be the next leaders of this company. I really believe that if I were Martin Jarman, I would already be thinking about Jerry Neuheisel being the successor to Chip Kelly because Ooh. he has all of the makings seven, eight, 10 years from now to take that on. He's understanding key positional coaches. He's very tight with Deshaun, very tight with Ken Norton Jr. So he's soaking all of that information up, being kind of a protege to Chip. I really see this as a seven, eight, 10 year succession plan because nobody 
loves UCLA more than Jerry Neuheisel, and he would be the ideal successor and a guy who's going to be there 20 years to bring UCLA where it belongs. So I love Neuheisel with the salad, the blonde salad. He loves to wear those Louis Vuitton, uh, you know, loafers on the field. Uh, you know, he got a lot of pub for that in the SC game last year, in the pregame. You know, he's got Louis. He's got the salad. He's got the pedigree. He's got the fashion. Jerry Neuheisel is my guy, and I absolutely love the pick, Will. Yeah, and it's just, you know, we didn't even bring up the fact that when he came in, I mean, UCLA fans love him right back. You know what his history, when he came into that Texas game and Hundley yep. went out, yep. you know, that's that's a that Jerry's be- world. That's AT&T Stadium. Like, yep. he had the 33-yard touchdown pass to seal the deal, to win that game, and come off the bench and make plays. So, New Heisel is a legend to fans, and it's becoming more and more apparent that he's legends to the players that he's coaching as well. So Jerry New Heisel, fourth pick. Well, we've reached the final pick of the Bruin Bible draft. My main man, Madman, has the final pick. Who are you going with and why for the final selection of the inaugural Bruin Bible positional coach draft? Thriller, you know, there's a there's a couple of names there that you and I have kind of touched on a little bit. I do think this position is obviously critical to the success of any football team. And this individual, I think, has done a tremendous job. I think there is a little bit of a gap between the top four moving forward. But having said that, Ryan Gunderson, quarterback coach, I think is really critical. And he's going to be someone that is going to be even more under the spotlight here this year and in the years to come, especially when we talk about the quarterback competition between the likes of Dante Moore and Garbers and Schley and et cetera, and who is going to really emerge here moving forward. And you brought up a great point, Will, where, you know, there's something to be said for the likes of Garbers and Justin Martin to sort of understand that, hey, the future of the franchise may have arrived, but I want to stay and I want to compete because I want to be in that environment, not just with great players, but with great positional coaches. And Gunderson brings that element of credibility and aura to these guys to want to stay. I think not enough has been made of even Gunderson's impact on DTR over the years. Obviously, so much conversation around the chip-DTR relationship, but especially when you look at the jumps that DTR made from time to time in the second half of last year, to the second half of this year, Gunderson played a really big role in how not only the game plan was conceived, but how DTR got the ball out of his hands quicker, how he was able to sort of read defenses quicker, how he was able to go to his progressions quicker. And obviously that's a work in progress for him going into the NFL moving forward. But Gunderson was huge in that regard. He comes from great pedigree. He was a quarterback himself. And so, again, that firsthand experience of this is what I'm looking for and this is what it takes to be successful is really critical. And so Gunderson, I think, has done tremendous work. But I think moving forward, he's going to be even more underneath the spotlight. And I think more of his skill set is going to come out, particularly in this quarterback competition in the spring and beyond. And it's just the room he's fostering, right? So you look at the talent. We said UCLA had the top quarterback room in the Pac-12 last year. It got deeper than last year. I don't even know how that's possible with losing the likes of a DTR. You have Garbers who could start for, you know, 40 to 50 D1 teams. You got Colin Schley who was a start. You know, he has no promise of even playing, especially over the likes of a Justin Martin, a Garbers, a Dante Moore, who's one of the five-star quarterbacks coming in. He makes that. And then you look at what he was able to do in the recruiting Luke Duncan, I think 99 times out of 100, a four-star quarterback yep. doesn't stay committed when a Dante Moore comes in. What does that say about the room that Ryan Gunderson is fostering at UCLA for all of these guys to be staying at least another year to try to figure this thing out because they want to make it work with the likes of a Chip Kelly and a Ryan Gunderson? So a phenomenal final pick. Madman, what are you getting into this weekend, dude? It's, it's the end of the podcast. Uh, hopefully we got to get together. We got to get a drink and, you know, yes, soon. Sir. And do something absolutely. We got to do. A, we got to get get together, brother, for sure. You know, do a little LAFB happy hour. We've been talking about it for a little bit. I'm hoping next week we can go and do that. You know, it's a muggy day a little bit today, so staying in, 
But uh, me and the wife doing a little bit of a double date with some friends down in uh, Marina Del Rey area. So that should be fun. And just kind of enjoying a, a little bit of downtime this weekend, my friend. How about yourself? Not much, dude. Uh, just reading this book and just getting excited, you know, for the potential of UCLA football being at its its ceiling. I think we're as close to our ceiling as we've been in a long, long time. So it's just a happy time for UCLA fans. Make sure you're liking and subscribing the YouTube channel. I know we took a huge jump this week. We almost got more than 100 subscribers uh, due to the Eric Kendricks interview and the interview that you guys did on the ESPN radio show. So we're building big things. Another special guest coming on Wednesday. I don't know if Madman can make this one, but he is invited. Quantrez Knight, the legendary safety for UCLA, coming in. He's going to be on the Bruin Bible. So a lot to look forward to this week. Uh, Bruin Bible, we are officially out. I hope you guys have a phenomenal rest of your weekend.